Welcome to Liberty.me Studio. Be part of the global liberty community at Liberty.me. Liberty lives here. The man we know today as Max Stirner was born on October 25, 1806, in Bayreuth, a venerable European town that, in our own time, is within the boundaries of what we call Germany. In Max Stirner's time, however, there was no such thing as Germany. The political unification of many, though not all, of the mostly small European countries in which German was the predominant language did not happen until 65 years after Stirner's birth, and he never lived to see it. As he saw it, he began his life as a resident and citizen of the Kingdom of Bavaria, and ended it not quite fifty years later as a resident and citizen of the nearby Kingdom of Prussia. Nor did the Bayreuth into which Stirner was born in 1806 bear much resemblance to the internationally famous tourist destination the town became nearly seventy years later, after Richard Wagner had set up shop there. In the early years of the 19th century, Bayreuth was just another sleepy Bavarian village, distinguished only by the unusually fine gymnasium, prep school for college-bound students, that operated within its town limits. It is perhaps appropriate, then, that when Max Stirner was born in Bayreuth on October 25, 1806, he was given an ordinary and undistinguished birth name. He started out in life not as Max Stirner, but as Johann Kaspar Schmidt. John Smith, we Americans would say. John K. Smith. His father, a flute maker who moonlighted as a painter of commissioned portraits of wealthy men and their families, was young, only in his late thirties, when his son was born. Yet within a few months of Johann's birth, he was dead, a victim of internal hemorrhage caused by an unspecified injury that he may have inadvertently brought upon himself. His widow, Johann's twenty-eight-year-old mother, remained single for a time. Then, two years almost to the day after the death of her first husband, she married her second, a Prussian pharmacist, a man old enough to be her father. Johann spent his early childhood with his mother and stepfather in Prussia, remembering little or nothing about any life he might have led before Prussia, in another country in another time. At the age of twelve he returned to Bavaria and Bayreuth to attend the gymnasium, where he stayed for eight years, living for all those years in the home of a childless couple, his father's sister, his paternal aunt, and her husband, who was also the boy's godfather. At the age of twenty he left Bayreuth one last time, traveling to Berlin to study at the university there. It was 1827 now. In a few months, Johann Kaspar Schmidt would be 21 years old, and already he had begun calling himself Max Stirner. Stirner was a nickname he had picked up during his years at the gymnasium. It is not known whether it was originally bestowed upon him in a spirit of affectionate jesting or in a spirit of mockery, even, perhaps, hatred. Die Stirne in German, is the brow or forehead. Young Johann's brow was unusually high, and thus called attention to itself. You might say calling him Stirner was a way of calling him what in English, since around the early 1890s, we would term a highbrow. Apparently, however, young Schmidt not only took no offense at this, he grew used to the new moniker and eventually came to prefer it to his actual surname. Of the origin of his given name, Max, nothing at all is known. What is known is that it was as Max Stirner, not Johann Kaspar Schmidt, that he arrived at the University of Berlin in the fall of 1827. And it wasn't long before, as Stirner's biographer John Henry Mackay puts it, he signed his first published works that way, 
He was exclusively addressed thus in the circle of his acquaintances, and that is what he called himself. Alas, 1827 was seven years too late for Stirner to have attended any of the lectures of Arthur Schopenhauer, where he might well have better spent his time than he did in the late 1820s, attending the lectures of Schopenhauer's great nemesis, G. W. F. Hegel. Schopenhauer considered Hegel a clumsy charlatan, and I, for one, am inclined to agree with him. Nevertheless, it was under Hegel that Max Stirner studied philosophy at the University of Berlin during the two years he matriculated there. And, as will become clear in a few minutes, there would seem to be a plausible case to be made that Stirner himself was no more entranced with Hegel than Schopenhauer was. He did not, however, leave the University of Berlin out of disappointment with Hegel. He moved on after two years to the University of Erlangen, and from there to the University of Königsberg, and from there back to the University of Berlin, where he finally completed his formal studies after eight years of intermittent, often interrupted effort. These interruptions, which served as the proximate cause of Stirner's long tenure as an undergraduate, do not seem to have been necessitated by either lack of money or boredom with the lectures he was now and then attending. Rather, they seem to have been necessitated by what David Leopold of Oxford University, the editor of the most recent edition of Stirner's principal work, calls his mother's deteriorating mental condition. And thereby, as I am wont to say, hangs a tale. For although his mother, as Leopold puts it, was committed as insane to the University Medical School's charity hospital in Berlin about nine months after Stirner finally finished up his degree, it was January of 1835 by now, and he was 28 years old. And though his mother was institutionalized for the rest of her life after that, he was able to move her into what Leopold calls a private mental hospital, and there it was that she spent her last 22 years. There seems to be no very specific record of exactly what it was that her doctors thought ailed her, Stirner's biographer, John Henry Mackay, wrote of her illness in the late 1890s that she suffered from an idée fixe. Today this sounds like a joke, I'll grant you. I had a friend some years back in San Francisco who always responded to any reminder of the fact that my wife and I would soon be moving to Houston by talking in a way that made her mental image of Texas abundantly clear. Hot, dry, dusty prairies, grazed by longhorn cattle who moved impassively among the cactus and the oil derricks. About the fifth time I explained to her that this image, if it resembled anything in the real world at all, resembled only the western part of Texas, and that East Texas, on the southwestern edge of which Houston was located, was much more like Louisiana, crisscrossed by bayous and swamps, rainy, humid, green, punctuated by the gray and black of pines and Spanish moss and various snakes. Well, my San Francisco friend said, I guess I have an idée fixe. No one at the party my friend and I were attending when she said that to me felt that she was clearly insane and should be locked up. Instead, people laughed. But in Stirner's time, more specifically in the mid-1830s, a time when psychiatry was only beginning to establish itself in the West, the term idée fixe was commonly employed by what today are usually called mental health professionals to describe what today would probably be diagnosed as obsessive-compulsive disorder. People whose physicians decided they suffered from an idée fixe back in the 1830s were not infrequently denied their legal rights as adult human beings. Stirner's mother, for example, when she was widowed the second time, 
when her second husband died of natural causes at the age of 76, had inherited the house they lived in together in Kulm. The town has been part of Poland since 1920 and is now known as Chelmno. But she and her son soon discovered that she would be unable to sell the house as she had planned and move to Berlin because she had been, in effect, declared incompetent to manage her own financial affairs, and it was now up to a conservator appointed by the local government to watch over the assets of what a local judge called the idiotic widow. In light of all this, what are we to make of the following famous passage from Stirner's principal work, his 1844 book, The Ego and Its Own? Man, Stirner wrote, your head is haunted. You have wheels in your head. You imagine great things and depict to yourself a whole world of gods that has an existence for you, a spirit realm to which you suppose yourself to be called, an ideal that beckons to you. You have a fixed idea. Do not think that I am jesting or speaking figuratively when I regard those persons who cling to the higher and, because the vast majority belongs under this head, almost the whole world of men, as veritable fools, fools in a madhouse. What is it, then, that is called a fixed idea, an idea that has subjected the man to itself? When you recognize with regard to such a fixed idea that it is a folly, you shut its slave up in an asylum. And is the truth of the faith, say, which we are not to doubt, the majesty of the people, which we are not to strike at? He who does is guilty of les majesty, virtue, against which the censor is not to let a word pass, that morality may be kept pure. Are these not fixed ideas? Is not all the stupid chatter of most of our newspapers the babble of fools who suffer from the fixed idea of morality, legality, Christianity, and so forth, and only seem to go about free because the madhouse in which they walk takes in so broad a space? Touch the fixed idea of such a fool, and you will at once have to guard your back against the lunatic's stealthy malice. For these great lunatics are like the little so-called lunatics in this point, too, that they assail by stealth him who touches their fixed idea. They first steal his weapon, steal free speech from him, and then they fall upon him with their nails. Every day now lays bare the cowardice and vindictiveness of these maniacs, and the stupid populace hurrahs for their crazy measures. One must read the journals of this period, and must hear the Philistines talk, to get the horrible conviction that one is shut up in a house with fools. Thou shalt not call thy brother a fool, if thou dost. But I do not fear the curse, and I say my brothers are arch-fools. Whether a poor fool of the insane asylum is possessed by the fancy that he is God the Father, Emperor of Japan, the Holy Spirit, or what not, or whether a citizen in comfortable circumstances conceives that it is his mission to be a good Christian, a faithful Protestant, a loyal citizen, a virtuous man. Both these are one and the same fixed idea. He who has never tried and dared not to be a good Christian, a faithful Protestant, a virtuous man, and the like, is possessed and prepossessed by faith, virtuousness, etc. Just as the schoolmen philosophized only inside the belief of the Church, as Pope Benedict XIV wrote fat books, inside the papist superstition, without ever throwing a doubt upon this belief. As authors fill whole folios on the state, without calling in question the fixed idea of the state itself. As our newspapers are crammed with politics, because they are conjured into the fancy that man was created to be a zoan politicon, 
So also subjects vegetate in subjection, virtuous people in virtue, liberals in humanity, without ever putting to these fixed ideas of theirs the searching knife of criticism. Undislodgeable, like a madman's delusion, those thoughts stand on a firm footing, and he who doubts them lays hands on the sacred. Yes, the fixed idea, that is the truly sacred. Stirner was an anarchist, an atheist, and a scoffer at those who took moral principles, any moral principles, at all seriously. He asked rhetorically, are my ideas my servants, or am I their servant? He wrote that each must say to himself, I am all to myself, and I do all for my sake. Away, then, with every business that is not altogether my business. You think, at least, the good cause must be my business? What good? What bad? Why, I myself am my business, and I am neither good nor bad. Neither has meaning for me. What is divine is God's business. What is human, man's. My business is neither what is divine nor what is human. It is not what is true, good, right, free, etc., but only what is mine. And it is no general business, but is unique, as I am unique. Nothing is more to me than myself. The state's behavior, he wrote, is violence, and it calls its violence law, but that of the individual crime. I am the mortal enemy of the state he thundered. Every state is a despotism, whether the despot be one or many, or whether, as people usually conceive to be the case in a republic, all are masters, that is, each tyrannizes over the others. When humans wish to work together to achieve common goals, Stirner insisted, what they need is not the state, but unions of egoists. For if he can use his fellow man, use their strength and assistance, then I am likely to come to an understanding and unite myself with them in order to strengthen my power by the agreement and to do more by joint force than individual force could accomplish. In this joinder I see nothing at all else than a multiplication of my strength, and only so long as it is multiplied strength do I retain it. Stirner was more than insistent on this point. He was, more or less, obsessive. The union is my own creation, he wrote, my creature, not sacred, not a spiritual power above my spirit, as little as any association of whatever sort. As I am not willing to be a slave to my maxims, but lay them bare to my constant criticism without any warrant, and admit no bail whatever for their continuance, so still less do I pledge myself to the Union for my future, and swear away my soul to it, as men are said to do with the devil, and as is really the case with the State and all intellectual authority. But I am, and remain more to myself than the State, church, God, and the like, and, consequently, also infinitely more than the Union. So, the moment he decides the Union no longer serves his personal purposes, he ends his association with it, though, of course, he may sign up with a different Union later that same day, if he sees it as another opportunity to multiply his own strength. All the quotations I've just presented are taken from Der Einzige und sein Eigentum, The Ego and Its Own, by Max Stirner. This book was written in the early 1840s, when Stirner was in his mid-thirties. He spent most of his days during this period teaching at a prestigious private high school for young ladies. His evenings, almost all of them, he spent socializing at Hippel's Wine Bar, where his learned, opinionated, and often somewhat rowdy companions were the journalists, authors, and young teachers like himself, who called themselves Defrian, the Free. 
Those who devoted themselves entirely to the great world beyond Hippel's walls, if they knew anything at all about these young intellectuals, probably knew them as the young Hegelians, or the left Hegelians. For what had brought these disputatious Bohemians together in the first place was an intellectual cause. They wanted to take Hegel's idea of the dialectical process of history, whereby, as the historian Oscar J. Hammond neatly summarizes it, rational progress and historical change result from the conflict of opposing views, ending in a new synthesis, and, as it were, soup it up. As Hammond puts it, the young Hegelians were bent on accelerating the process by criticizing all that they considered irrational, outmoded, and repressive. Their first assault was directed against the foundations of Christianity. Their second, like the first, couched in traditional Hegelian terminology, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, was an impassioned defense of liberalism over monarchy. Stirner was a regular at Hippel's, and listened with evident interest to all the arguments and debates that went on there, seldom offering any comment himself, more often making a remark or two sotto voce to whoever was sitting next to him on that particular evening. Not infrequently that person sitting in the next chair or on the next stool had difficulty deciding whether Stirner's remark was meant ironically. It was at Hippel's that Stirner met and wooed Marie Dainhart, a pretty blonde from the provinces, as they say, a smart, fun-loving girl who had come to the big city with a small fortune of an inheritance in her pocket to seek out the company of the Bohemians and renegade intellectuals who shared her advanced ideas. Marie was known to smoke cigars and dress in men's clothes. She married Stirner in his apartment one day in 1843. They must have been quite a striking couple while their brief liaison lasted. She was a blue-eyed Nordic type. He was a strawberry blonde, both atop his head and with respect to his facial hair. He did not allow his beard to grow, but did cultivate a long and luxuriant mustache, which may have joined at its ends with his sideburns. The unusually high forehead, which had given him the name Sterner in the first place, the piercing blue eyes, the ruddy complexion, the pointed nose and strong jaw, the general slightness and thinness of his body, his meticulous dress, his wire-rimmed spectacles, his small sensitive hands, this is the whole of what little more has come down to us about his appearance. Not a single photograph of him is known to survive, assuming any were ever made. Photography was still in its infancy during the last decade of Stirner's life, the period in which he was most likely to have been photographed. The drawings of him that have survived were made by people who had known him only slightly many years before, and who had but scant talent as draftsmen. Their sketches might entertain lovers of stick figures, if such there be, but in this instance at least, the heads on the stick bodies bear little resemblance to the man described just now. In the pre-Marie days, one can imagine Stirner sitting up all night after an evening at Hippel's, writing at white heat, not bothering to stop to reconcile apparent contradictions in his manuscript, not stopping to make corrections or revisions, not stopping for anything, just barreling forward at top speed until it was time to freshen up and get over to the school and teach the teenage girls their literature and their history. After Marie came into the picture, one suspects he may often have given the wee hours over to other sorts of entertainment. The ego and its own, after all, is dedicated to my sweetheart, Marie Dainhart. Join me in the first week of June for part two of this discussion of Max Stirner and his work. This is Jeff Riggenbach. 
Thanks for listening to Liberty.me Studio. The views expressed on this show are not necessarily those of Liberty.me. Join the global Liberty community today at Liberty.me. Liberty lives here.